Hey guys, so I'm here today with Dr. Carl Ducham. Uh, he is based out of the Longevity Clinic in Naples, Florida. Uh, some of you guys have probably uh, seen video one or part one where uh, Lane and I traveled down to Naples to have all of our bloods taken. We did full body MRI scans. Uh, we actually got to go over our blood work in uh, part one of this video. Uh, it's been eight weeks. We've got our uh, genetic information uh, ready to go. So today's call, I'm going to be talking with Carl and he's going to be going over uh, all of the uh, results um, of this genetic testing. So I'm really excited. Uh, I, I'm super keen to find out uh, if there is anything major that I have or don't have, um, which kind of takes me out of being a high risk for certain chronic disease. So Carl, take it away. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, Holly. Hey. Um, so uh, today we've got two genetic reports we're going to discuss, and then we're going to discuss um, a uh, body composition report as well. And then we'll uh, we'll look over a hippocampus report looking at your memory centers. Okay. Um, just briefly. We discussed that in person, I think. Before. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Okay, good. Um, so the, the genetic reports... Uh, we have the first report is um, it's medically significant findings, things that could change your actual health care, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that we could, you know, we could be diagnosing you with uh, that are medically significant. Um, and the uh, second study is more of a recreational uh, research document uh, okay. that compiles risk, risk for several uh, dozens of diseases and looks at specific character traits, uh, caffeine metabolism, um, fast twitch muscle fiber, uh, you know, uh, vitamin metabolism, things like that. Okay. So, um, so with the first report, um, I'll, I'll pull it up and we'll share my screen in just a moment uh, yeah. when we look at the report. Uh, but the first report is going to be breaking down your DNA by looking at the DNA alphabet. Those are all the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. Okay. And, these bases, they, they pair together and they form a long string uh, to form a double helix, and that's our DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so we performed whole genomic sequencing to look at all of these base pairs, and then we compare them to an international reference sequence to look for uh, variants. And we, call, we used to call them mutations. Now we call them variants. They're just variations. <laughs> yep. uh, they're, not, they're not all dangerous or bad. Um, some of them code for hair color, eye color. Um, certain character traits, mm -hmm. and then others code for the way a protein may fold or an enzyme may function. And if those don't act properly, they could form disease. Okay. Uh, so we look at that. So uh, basically, whole genome sequencing is like looking at a whole set of encyclopedias. We are reading line by line, letter by letter. We're looking for spelling errors, run-on sentences, punctuation errors. Uh, and then if we do find those errors, we call them variants. Yep. Um, so there are some limitations to whole genome sequencing. Uh, we cannot detar detect large chunks of information that are missing. So if somebody went up to that 10 book set of encyclopedias and ripped a whole page out, mm -hmm. we would not detect that because we're looking just line by line for spelling errors. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to pull up the first report. I'm going to share my screen, and the, these are going to be medically significant findings. Okay. So um, we will see um, your, your information, my information, and, uh, and over here is kind of the analytical side. Okay. So um, current technology lets us look at about 93 to 95% of the whole genome. Wow. That's just the scientific limitation of where we're at with technology mm -hmm. uh, in 2019. So for you, we looked at 2.74 billion base pairs. Mm -hmm. The human genome has 3.2 billion in total. Wow. And of those 2.74 billion we looked at, we found you have 4.1 million different variants mm -hmm. or alterations. That's about normal. Yep. Uh, most people have about 4 to 4.3 million. So your, your results are in line with normal people. Yep. And again, these character traits or, um, or disease traits even. Yep. Um, we looked at 1,490 genes. And within those genes, we looked at 1,641 different diseases. Okay. And, and there's a number that's not on here. Within those diseases, we looked at over 85,000 different variations of disease. Wow. So 
Um, so if we move to the right hand side of the page, um, we found no significant uh, genetic diseases in you. Nothing that is affecting you or will affect you in the future. Okay. Uh, so that is excellent, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Good news, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Um, before I go down to uh, carrier variants and the rest of the document, um, let's well, let's just backtrack a little bit. So, uh, generally speaking, there's uh, two different types of inheritance patterns: mm -hmm. uh, autosomal dominant, um, which uh, which is when we only need one copy, one bad copy of the gene to be affected. Mm -hmm. So, if we back up to biology, yep. mom gives us one gene. Yep. Uh, one copy of a gene and dad gives us one copy of the gene also so for each gene we have two copies yep. and if, if they're healthy they're healthy we don't report them out here in the study mm -hmm. um, so in autosomal dominant conditions if you have one bad copy you could potentially be affected uh, in autosomal recessive conditions you need two bad copies mom has to give you a bad copy and mm -hmm. dad has to give you a bad copy for you to be affected now, if just dad gives you a bad copy, then um, you would be a carrier in those autosomal recessive conditions. Okay. So it, it most likely wouldn't affect you, uh, but that could be something that you could still pass on to your children or um, looking at it another way, your siblings could be, a, uh, could be carriers as well. Okay. Um, so for you, in those autosomal recessive conditions we looked at, mm -hmm. we identified two conditions that you carry one one bad copy of these genes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll look at these genes down here. Um, and then we also looked at some drug metabolism, which we will get to. Okay. So um, these are the genes we identify. We identified you as a carrier. Um, the first gene is the C9 gene. Yeah. Um, and again, the zygosity is heterozygous. This means you have one bad copy. Okay, mm -hmm. one normal and one a different copy. Yep. If you were homozygous, you would have uh, two bad copies. Yeah, basically. this is taking me back to my biology days at school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive. So again, that tells us you would need two bad copies of the gene to be affected. Mm -hmm. um, so this gene uh, produces a, uh, um, it's a, it's a protein that's involved in your immune system reaction called the complement reaction pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's nine different complement factors that go and try to attack a, a bacterial cell um, to uh, make it uh, make it go away and eliminate it um, if it gets inside of us. Okay. Um, so this uh, actually, if we go down the next page of the document, this yes. will give you more information on this okay. as well. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Um, so for you, uh, this could. Um, this will not affect you, uh, but you could potentially, there's a 50% chance if you decide to have children, this may uh, be passed along. Okay, uh, so for example, yeah. if Lane uh, was also um, a recessive carrier of this gene mm -hmm. and we had we decided to have children, there would be potential to actually have a child that would um, have this dysfunction? Right, there, there would be a 25% chance. If right. each of you are carriers, 25% mm -hmm. of of your offspring yeah. um, would uh, have this disease. Mm -hmm. So again, it leads to a severe immunodeficiency mm -hmm. um, uh, disease and you're susceptible to severe recurrent infections. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, there's more information in here. Yeah, um, it's, I'll have a read of that. Rare. This gene is pretty rare, uh, this, uh, you know, this disease. Yeah. So um, let's go up to uh, the second one we identified. Yeah. Uh, the gene is the HFE gene. Okay. And the disease is hemochromatosis. Oh yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so hemochromatosis um, is actually quite common um, amongst Caucasian populations. Mm -hmm. uh, ab about nine percent of people have some form of hemochromatosis. Mm -hmm. uh, what, um, so hemochromatosis. Uh, codes for an iron storage disorder mm -hmm. um, where we take up too much iron and we begin to accumulate it in our organs and in our joints. So it can it can cause uh, cardiomyopathies, mm -hmm. it can cause liver disease, liver cirrhosis, and can cause very bad arthritis. Yeah. Uh, typically, uh, people who have two bad copies of this gene, um, 
Um, actually, you're, there's a couple different, in this gene, there's a couple different um, uh, variations Variance. that can that we can find. Yours is the better of the two, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me go down here and, uh, and just say, so, um, so hemochromatosis, um, it's typically diagnosed in uh, between the ages of 40 and 60 for most people. Mm -hmm. um, but with this particular variant, um, this uh, HIS 63 to aspartame, yeah. or aspartate, uh, this uh, variant uh, does not confer as much risk for hemochromatosis. Yeah. So um, people who have two bad copies of this particular gene um, rarely even show signs of the disease. Mm -hmm. So you have one bad copy. So um, uh, your, your likelihood of even displaying elevated uh, iron or ferritin levels mm -hmm. is very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. um, so we would, we would say that this particular condition has low penetrance yeah. or it is not expressed um, uh, as well as other diseases. Mm -hmm. So, so um, for yeah, those ahead. of you who are listening, um, so in the case of somebody that does have uh, hemochromatosis, uh, they actually probably need to be quite mindful of their iron consumption from dietary sources. Uh, and often these people will actually have to go and uh, give blood uh, just to ensure that their iron levels um, are within the normal uh, physiological ranges so that these um, health risks that are associated with excessive iron absorption um, are no longer uh, as high of a risk. So thankfully I don't have that, but yeah, interesting to see yeah. they have that um, risk actually, as well. So when we did your blood work uh, a couple months ago, we looked at your ferritin level. That's a marker for iron yeah. uh, in the yeah. blood. Your ferritin was stone cold normal. Mm -hmm. Your level was 74. Yeah. So yours is absolutely normal. And we MRI your liver. We looked for iron deposition within the liver, mm -hmm. and you had you had normal levels of iron in, in your liver. So there were absolutely no signs of iron accumulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, this um, this is an autosomal recessive disease. Um, for you to be affected, you would likely have to have another um, another genetic variant in the same gene, mm -hmm. um, and you'd have to carry both copies. So, yeah. Um, Let's let's continue uh, going down. So we're going to talk about pharmacogenomics. Okay. This is looking at specific genes, and we've identified uh, specific genes that metabolize certain medications. Um, either they slowly metabolize them or they quickly metabolize them, and this can have all sorts of different uh, results depending on the medication. Either the medication could be ineffective, or it could cause increased risk of bleeding, or mm -hmm. you know whatnot. Yep. So. Um, here, here are the genes we looked at, the um, listed here on the left. Mm -hmm. And the phenotype is just, this is what we found for you, okay? Yeah. So for the CYP2C9 gene, mm -hmm. we found you are an intermediate metabolizer, mm -hmm. meaning you process these drugs more slowly, and okay. we'll get into what that means. Oh, uh -huh. And then here, CYP2D6, you metabolize these drugs very, very quickly. And we'll discuss some of the, the risks with these medications. Yeah. So in general, um, this is one of these uh, one of these tables that um, you would want to bring to your doctor and share with your doctor, because if they ever need to prescribe one of these medications, mm -hmm. they may want to choose a different medication, or they they may want to choose a different dose. Okay. So uh, let's let's go down and this breaks it down for us. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so this tells us exactly. Um, so, for example, the first drug, Rhythmol, um, certain people who have atrial fibrillation may get placed on this drug okay. uh, to, to slow their heart, their heart down, their heart rate down, and keep their heart in normal rhythm. Okay. Uh, so, if you needed this drug, it would have reduced efficacy uh, okay. because your body is metabolizing it quicker. It's clearing your system quicker, quicker, so you're going to have lower blood levels of the drug. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's look at some of the more common drugs. Um, a couple of these, uh, are neuropathic drugs used for neuropathic pain or, um, I see antidepressants is kind of there. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yes. Antidepressant, uh, Effexor or Venlafaxine, very common antidepressant. Yeah. Uh, again, um, reduced efficacy, lower blood levels of the drug if yeah. you ever needed it. 
Well, um, actually, when I was younger, uh, I did suffer from uh, depression, and I actually was hospitalized for uh, depression, and I remember taking Effexor, actually. Um, hmm. But it's interesting that that particular drug, I metabolize it very quickly. So would that mean that if they were going to make a choice of that particular antidepressant drug, that it would need to be prescribed at a higher dose or yeah. perhaps an alternative? Yeah. In the, um, the CDC and the FDA, actually, they made guidelines here. Um, so your physicians could go to these guidelines here. Yeah. Um, there's either the DPW guidelines or there's CPIC, CPIC guidelines mm -hmm. that are aimed at prescribing these medications with these genetic variations. Okay. So, um, the other big drug on this list is Zofran. Mm -hmm. Zofran or Dancitron is probably the most commonly prescribed uh, anti-nausea medicine in the hospital setting. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I've definitely seen that a lot. In pill form or IV form. Yeah. So again, your body metabolizes this quicker than most, so reduced efficacy, lower blood levels. Mm -hmm. So you may need a lot more, more, higher, stronger dose or more frequent dosing if you ever needed this medicine. Yeah, okay. So, um, there's more drugs on the list. Um, we'll kind of hit some highlights here. So, um, warfarin blood is a common blood thinner, uh, blood thinner uh, prescribed for blood clots or people who are at risk for stroke. Um, this tells us with your genetic variation, uh, you're more sensitive to warfarin, so you, you may bleed easily mm -hmm. on this medication. So they may want to choose a different medication if you ever needed this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have oxycodone, so this is an opioid pain medicine, and codeine, an opioid-based pain medicine as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're at risk for increased side effects, nausea, vomiting, respiratory depression, confusion, urinary retention, hmm. uh, because of the way you metabolize these drugs. Right. Same thing with tramadol. These are all three pain medications. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't um, think I've actually ever um, been prescribed any of those, even with different surgeries. So. Yeah, uh, I can't remember which ones I was actually prescribed, but none of those. But interesting that it would give me more side effects. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, yeah. So you would need either smaller doses or a different medicine altogether. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the highlights um, through those charts, um, and then uh, finally, uh, this last table just shows us how many different genes in which different body systems we looked at. Yeah. Um, and then how many variations of those uh, genes we looked at. And then finally, on the right column, which ones we identified. Yeah. So this one was the C9 gene. We, we identified you're a carrier state. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the metabolic disorder was the, uh, uh, the HFE. Yeah. So, um, so we look at 87 different cancer genes and over 21,000 different variations of hereditary cancers. Mm. Uh, these are common breast cancers, BRCA1, yep. BRCA2, CHECK2, yep. the most common uh, breast cancer genes, um, colon cancer genes, um, mm -hmm. and, okay. and those in order. So that would suggest then that based on my genetics, uh, I would be lower risk for all of those conditions other than those that have been kind of identified at variance. So, so yeah, the, the next report we're actually going to we're going to look at several other genes that are smaller and less significant, but in combination with other genes can add on risk. Okay. So these are the, the big well-known genes that have been discovered right. that we pulled out in this document. Okay. Um, at the bottom, we have the appendix. We've discussed methods, limitations. Um, I like to point out, here's a full list of all 1,490 genes we looked at. It's a, it's, I think it's a 42 page PDF file, but that lists out all the genes and which syndromes they're associated with. Okay. Oh, that's cool. So once we get off this call, I will email you these documents in PDF form, uh, in, in a security email. Yep. And then you can click on this if you wanted to do kind of a deep dive. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, uh, let's go to the second genetic report. Again, this is more research, uh, research based, um, more recreational. These are not significant findings that are going to change the way um, you manage disease, um, but they can be used as motivational factors to make lifestyle changes. For example, if you have increased risk for Alzheimer's dementia, 
Okay. We would, you know, we would recommend avoiding alcohol, um, uh, avoiding cigarette smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, regular, we would want you to regularly exercise, which we all know you do. Um, <laughs> you actually, what you probably you? check all these boxes anyway. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it could help keep you on on track you uh -huh. know, during your lifetime. Okay. So. Um, so this report was built using uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, there are studies where they're looking at thousands and thousands of people who have a particular disease, mm -hmm. a cancer, um, and they're looking at their genetics to see if they have any similar genes. Okay. So um, again, these are smaller, less well-known genes that by themselves do not cause disease, um, but in combination with other genes can be uh, increased risk yeah. uh, or disease. Okay. Um, again, they're not medically significant. Um, we call these polygenic risk scores uh, because they're based on these multiple genes. Okay. Um, let's just kind of jump right in. Um, I always like to look at um, cancer predisposition, and we're not. This is a seventy-five page document. Um, we're not going to go through every single thing in person here. Yeah. Um, there's there's just a lot to it, um, but we'll kind of hit the highlights here. Yep. So um, this on the left here, these are your chromosomes. So we have uh, 22 chromosomes, and then we have our sex chromosomes. You have two copies of X because yep. you're female. And so, for example, for breast cancer, um, we we look at all of these genes. Okay. So we're several genes across all these chromosomes to build this risk score. Okay. Uh, I'm going to increase this here. Yep. So that's good. Uh, the, of, of the thousands of people that they looked at in the study that had breast cancer, um, you are not as similar to them, uh, to their genetics. If you had a very high risk, you would be more similar to those people with breast cancer. Yeah. And yep. if you were at the very low end, you would be less similar to them. And if you were in the middle, that, that just gives you average risk. Okay. So you have less risk for breast cancer based on all of these genes. Okay. Uh, and, and there's a link. Um, I, I can show you the link uh, where it shows you how they built the model and, and how many different genes they looked at for this particular model. And okay. it links up to the research study too, the genome-wide okay. association huh. study. So, um, so let's say your risk was the highest of the high. That doesn't mean you're going to get the disease, okay? Yeah. And likewise, if you have the lowest amount of risk, it doesn't mean you can't get, get the disease. disease. Yeah. This is just a risk score. So um, as we, we've said before, genes load the gun and environment and lifestyle pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. so if you're overweight and you're smoking cigarettes and drinking heavily and not exercising, your risk is going up and up and up. Yeah. So, or if you're doing all the healthy things, your risk is going down. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so these are your overall uh, uh, cancer risks. Um, we don't have every single type of cancer built built into these disease risks. Um, so I wanted to show you for breast cancer. So we have a discussion about the disease uh, risk factors. There's more reading we link out to, and then we provide a link to your results guide, mm -hmm. and that would tell you uh, what your results mean and how many uh, genetic, or how many genes this model was built on. Okay. So um, let's go back up to the glossary. And um, so the, this is kind of uh, all of these different health categories here in section two. Mm -hmm. Section three is discussing physical traits, um, hair color, hair texture, um, some fitness genes we look at in here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also go into an some ancestry looking thousands and thousands of years back. Um, That's really cool because I don't know anything about my ancestry. So <laughs> yeah, actually can, um, uh, I want to look at some of these with you, but let's jump to the ancestry uh, because uh, you have a very unique result for your ancestry. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so this is the the general map we're looking at um, yeah. from migration patterns uh, from up to two hundred thousand years ago from pre Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. um, this map is the same for everybody. Yeah. Um, but here's where we're looking at all of these different chromosomes and which which regions you make up. Okay. So 
You are exclusively based on your DNA from Western Europe, 100%. Really? I have seen nobody else that is 100% from one particular <laughs> region. Wow. Okay. Huh. That is very, that's cool. Well, now I know. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So it's not, um, you know, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they do a good job of telling us which specific country. Mm -hmm. um, our Ancestry is uh, more of a, a larger overview, and um, it's not as specific, but it goes back a lot further. Okay. Uh, so we go into some different uh, haplotypes, um, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago where, you know, where your subclade H1 came from, okay. you know, uh, so this was Europe. And if, if you dig down here, um, uh, Libya, Europe, uh, mostly French, France, Portugal, uh, Spain. Hmm. So, that's um, really, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So for the um, for the guys out there, we also look at your paternal your paternal lineage. So we give you maternal from your mother and paternal from your father uh, okay. because you have an X and a Y chromosome. So females, you have two Just X two X's, chromosomes. right? Mm -hmm. Just maternal. So I'm super interested to see where Elaine uh, descends yeah. from. <laughs> yeah, it's so then, considering um, I like I live so, from in Australia. It's it's a, a fairly big stretch. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we also go back about 60,000 years um, to look at uh, Homo sapiens. So you're 98.05% Homo sapien and, uh, you know, 1.9%, 1.95 Neanderthal. So, <laughs> okay, um, let's go back to some of these health categories. Um, uh, let's see, I took a couple notes here. Um, honestly, of these health categories, um, nothing, nothing really jumped off the page. Um, there were a couple nutritional things I wanted to discuss. Um, yeah. and then, uh, did you want to look at uh, anything in particular right now? Um, I would have been interested in digestion just in that I was given a positive for celiac, uh, when I was 24 and you, we haven't touched on the genetic coding for yeah. celiac so that so, was really nice <laughs> so uh again this is not diagnosed disease it only projects risk mm -hmm. so um, of this risk model so all of these dark blue areas are all the genes we the check for that. The chromosomes yeah to build the celiac model yeah um, based on thousands of people and uh, according to to that genetic database you would be at less risk yeah. for c Disease. Yeah, I see. IBS, Although, uh, IBD is actually higher, huh? Yeah, so that was um, that was kind of interesting. I thought too. So yeah, maybe yeah. it's time so, for me to go again, back. Again, it breaks and... down what celiac disease is, um, and then it you know it links out to your results guide and how they how they built the yeah. model and everything. Okay. So, um, yeah, that was the only one that I really was keen to have a look at, but um, I also yeah. had issues with my memory. Um, but I don't think there was uh, anything that you suggested that there would be like a hit, uh, that I'm that predisposes me to increase risk for like Alzheimer's or any of those other neurological um, conditions. Yeah, let's. Um, I'm trying to find the page here for it. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, Twenty-seven. Okay. So your your risk for Alzheimer's is a little bit less uh, than average. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Parkinson's slightly a little bit more, um, multiple sclerosis a, a little bit higher than average. Yeah. So, um, but Alzheimer's, so speaking of Alzheimer's, we looked in our first document, we looked at a particular gene, the APOE gene, mm -hmm. to yeah. see if you carry the E4 allele, which mm -hmm. has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, the lifetime risk of Alzheimer's disease for somebody without particular genetics for the APOE is about low. 10 10 percent or so yeah um, if you carry one of those bad copies it increases your risk to 20 to 25 okay. percent and if you have two bad copies you're anywhere between 30 and 55 percent mm. so but we did not find those yeah those genes. oh that, that's good that's great <laughs> so um 
let's uh, let's go. Let's look at some of the nutritional yeah. Uh, stuff. Yeah, you said there was a couple of interesting things that you kind of wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know we've talked about caffeine before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've always wondered about this. Yeah. So you do have two copies that uh, for fast metabolism of caffeine. I knew it. <laughs> If you have a caffeinated beverage or a caffeine pill or something with caffeine in it, it will go through your system much quicker than the average person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, guys, I think I talked about this on uh, my YouTube channel multiple times. I just feel like I could drink coffee. I could be in bed and have like a triple shot coffee and I'm just like, it does nothing. So... Um, yeah, this, if this makes perfect sense, that I have those two genetic um, variants that mm -hmm. code for fast yeah. metabolism of caffeine. Yeah, I have, um, I know people who have two slow copies. Uh, we've looked at their genetics and uh, they have a sip of coffee and they're, and they're wired. Yeah, so. it, it's, I, it probably makes sense when um, some people will talk about um, their consumption of um, caffeinated beverages and just the effects that they will like, describe to you um and it, yeah it is completely the opposite to how i feel so i'm assur assuming other, it's accurate the other part of the yeah the other part of the caffeine equation of course is tolerance if you drink caffeine a or lot. consume caffeine all the time you can build up tolerance yeah. and it's less effective too so that's yeah, the other side of the coin exactly so like for example when um we went and did our powerlifting meet um I and Lane, even though I didn't feel like it was going to have that much of an effect, uh, we actually completely reduced our caffeine uh, consumption about seven days before to kind of, um, I guess, help with your tolerance. When you do start consuming it again, you respond to it really well. And there's plenty of scientific papers that actually have shown that this is to be the case. So, yeah, um, I'm interested to see whether Lane um, is or has two of the slow copies um based on what he kind of gets out of you know caffeine so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um good, good stuff uh, we look at folate metabolism okay. um uh, you know studies are different um but i've seen studies that say about 50 percent of us uh, carry abnormal copies of this particular gene mthfr yeah uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase yep. uh, and that that codes for decreased levels of activated folate in our blood and folate is really important um, yeah. for what's called methylation that's mm -hmm. where we do dna repair yeah so for example if um if you have toxins in your environment uh, even a sun exposure damages the skin and we need folate to help with methylate, dna repair yeah. to repair damages in the in our skin uh, induced by the sun um, so some people don't, uh, this gene doesn't work properly for them, uh, so they, they do not methylate properly. Okay. Um, so we look at folic acid, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. They all work together for methylation. Yeah. Um, so you may be at risk for decreased serum folate levels. So, yeah. um, of course, we know you eat lots of vegetables, so you probably get enough folate. Yeah. No. I, I do, and I think we actually discussed that in my uh, questionnaire. It was something like 60 or 70 servings a week. And yeah. folic acid, for those of you watching, uh, is uh, a very well, a very rich source of folic uh, acid or folate is from um, leafy green vegetables um, or like your cruciferous greens. So uh, for me, that's kind of a driver. Like I know that I need to have a lot of that anyway, and this is it's good to know that I've been doing the right thing. Um, yeah. if you're not, especially for, you know, mothers that are planning to, you know, fall pregnant, um, folic acid is especially important, um, for, um, the prevention of neurotube defects. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's something else that this is really important for. Um, so we looked at, uh, vitamin A, um, we found no significant variants, uh, for vitamin A, uh, deficiency risk. Cool. Um, vitamin B12. We actually tested your vitamin B12 level. Yours was normal. Yeah, we did. And then uh, B6, again, you have a, a risk of decreased vitamin B6, which is works with the folate for methylation. Okay. So, hmm. so um, that being said, uh, for somebody else that was to have this test done and they were low, or so they possess this uh, gene variant, um, you would probably suggest 
either supplementation or increased yeah. consumption of dietary sources, right? Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, preferred preferred would be dietary sources, yeah. um, okay. but otherwise a, a good multivitamin, mm -hmm. um, you know, nothing against uh, over-the-counter vitamins, uh, but there are some uh, some lab companies that produce high quality mm -hmm. uh, vitamins uh, that have been uh, tested for purity and, and potency. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend one of those companies. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could always ask your doctor to check your vitamin levels too, to see yeah. if you are deficient. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we looked at uh, vitamin D, uh, typical risk of uh, deficiency in both, both of these. Uh, yeah. And I think my vitamin D, when we tested it, was actually normal. I think Lane's was actually yeah. low. Um, so, yeah, it'd be, yeah. it'd be cool to see if he also has an increased risk based on his genetics, whether he really should be getting some extra vitamin D. So Yeah, yeah. so your, your B12 was completely normal. Yeah. Um, yours was on the, the high end, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it probably re reflects back to where we actually source vitamin B12 from, which is uh, by and large animal animal products. So for vegans um, who are not, or vegetarians who are not eating a lot of uh, animal protein, um, they usually have to go and have a vitamin T a B12 uh, injection so that they're not missing out on, on that, that important uh, vitamin. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's go... Um we'll just review uh, one more area in here. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to look at uh, just a couple of your fitness genes, which uh, one of them is particularly interesting. So, okay, cool. Um, so we looked at two of these genes um, in, in certain uh, marathon runners and triathletes. Um, they have found that certain areas within these two genes can code for um, elite endurance potential. Uh, these people, most marathon runners will have these variations within these genes. Actually, you're normal for these genes. That's not what, what I wanted to point out, um, but you're normal for endurance based on these two genes. Yeah. Um, there are several other genes out there that can code, uh, help code for endurance. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to look at uh, this one, so the ACTN3 gene yeah. uh, is probably one of the most studied fitness genes out there. Uh, there's been a lot of research on it. 18% um, of, uh, of white people have a genetic variation in this gene where they do not produce fast twitch muscle fibers. Okay. They do not produce the protein actin yeah. uh, that ma helps make up fast twitch uh, muscle fibers. Yeah. Those are for strength, speed, powerlifting. So we looked at your copies. You are actually genetically rare. You have two rare copies huh. of, of this gene saying you would be um, a power, strength, speed oriented athlete. Huh. That's cool. Um, it would be actually really awesome to um, go and have some of the uh, muscle testing. We actually got to speak with Dr. Andy Galpin um, a couple of weeks back who does a lot of the research in the different muscle fiber types um, and he was kind of talking to us on our podcast just last week about that. And, um, we were kind of all joking around trying to work out who, who of us was going to have the, uh, the cool genes. So I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be some rivalry going on here between Lane and I. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I must have more, this, does this particular gene code for, um, type one, um, muscle fiber types? If it's... I'm looking at like so, being power orientated. Yeah, so these are, um, so yeah, type one is slow twitch, uh, more endurance. Um, yeah. And these um, these particular uh, variations code for more type two. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you have a C allele, that means you can produce the, the, the protein for type two muscle fibers. And if you have two of them, that means you produce a lot of them. Okay. A lot of proteins for those fibers. Hmm. So you still will have type one fibers, yeah. um, but this just tells us you have a predominant amount of type two fibers. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to, uh, we have uh, just a, a couple more uh, documents to discuss that aren't, n aren't nearly as lengthy, mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'm going to send you these documents yeah. and uh, review them. If you have any other questions, I'm more than, more than happy uh, uh, to discuss uh, results and uh, yeah. the findings with you. Yeah. Um, so let's switch gears here. Um, 
you uh, we talked about your hippocampus before right yes we did you were normal yes. so we said your hippocampus was normal your memory centers of the brain were normal yep um so uh, we'll we'll skip that since we already discussed that yep let's see i need to so i got a good size brain guys you hear that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, the final report uh, is based on our MRI findings. Uh, we did uh, body composition profile analysis based on the MRI. Yeah. So this does not give us grams or kilograms. Um, it gives us volume, so liters. Okay. So um, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. So uh, we looked at the amount of visceral adipose tissue, VAT. So yeah. that's organ fat, visceral fat. Mm -hmm. We found that you had 0.23 liters, um, which is a very, 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 very small amount of yeah. visceral fat, organ fat. Yeah. Normal, normal females your age and height have between 0.68 and 1.59 liters. Mm -hmm. um, and if we look at, at this picture, we see very little areas of pink and red. Yeah. Uh, that they would be lit up uh, if you had more uh, yeah. visceral fat. It looks like it's kind of centering is around my kidneys. I look like yeah. I have a little bit of a yeah. visceral fat. Typically, um, I've got a bigger blow up of this to look at in a second. Yeah, okay. Um, and then we also looked at the abdominal subcutaneous adipose tissue. So okay. that's our, our love handle fat, our exterior fat. Yeah. Um, and that would be uh, the light blue areas around our frame. Yeah. Um, and you have very little. Mm -hmm. uh, the average person, the average female, your height and, and age would have between three and seven liters, and you have 1.6 liters hmm. so very very low um, and we'll talk about the significance of these in just a moment yep um, and then uh, we looked at muscle composition within your hips and your legs mm -hmm. you'll see um, your total muscle composition was 14.5 liters normal person uh, of your uh, a normal female <laughs> your age and height is 8.6 to 10 liters so you have uh, increased uh, muscle volume yes winning <laughs> the, the MRI said it's true <laughs> yes it confirms all that training is working <laughs> yeah. this um, this first uh, table is the most important table um, for for everybody out there um, this is your visceral adipose tissue index mm -hmm. this is like the BMI uh, for your organ fat Mm -hmm. um, most people, uh, the average person, 50% of people are going to be along this dark line. Yep. Uh, Holly, yours is um, even, off didn't the even make the blue. Much, actually, <laughs> actually, your organ fat is so low, um, uh, you're off of this chart. Um, the reason why this is important is from a body composition standpoint, visceral fat gives us a, a very high predictor uh, or disease. elevated risk for yeah. cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease like diabetes, yeah. and uh, fatty liver disease and cirrhosis mm -hmm. from fatty liver disease. So we want this number as low as we can get it. Okay. So you're doing the right thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to skip over these here. Um, this fat ratio um, just tells us how your body likes to store the fat. If you were to get fat, mm -hmm. um, the higher you are, the more organ fat it would be. The lower you are, the more it would be in your um, extremities. Love handles. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, these are the images. Again, the red or the pink is your visceral organ, your organ fat. Yeah. So there's very little, um, okay. very little here. The, you know, the kidneys are are here. Yeah. So a little bit around the kidneys. Okay. And then your subcutaneous fat, there's very little yeah. in that blue line. And then we can see your excellent muscle development. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So um, there's an appendix at the at the bottom that just tells us uh, what all of these things mean. Okay. So um, that is all I have uh, for uh, for your reports here on yeah. uh, uh, do you have any any final thoughts, questions, comments? No, I'm on? just really excited to go and uh, look through all of the different like genetic variants that people can have. Like I, I'm super interested in that stuff. I I just like learning. So uh, I'm sure I'll probably have lots of questions for you afterwards. But 
half an hour. No, that's really great. It sounds like I'm super healthy, which is a good thing. Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, genetic uh, variants that are putting me at risk for uh, anything that is, um, you know, common, like a common disease. So yeah, mm. I'm, I'm really happy with that outcome. Yeah, I'd say that the, the big the big things to, to, to highlight are um, we did not find any any Alzheimer's uh, gene, the APOE, mm -hmm. that can also confer risk for cardiac disease. We did not find that. Yeah. Um, we looked at all these hereditary cancers. We did not find any. Yeah. Um, so you've That's got awesome. a very clean uh, risk profile. Yeah. Um, and even for having children, you don't, you know, yeah. you don't have a lot of carrier variants to pass on potentially. So. Yeah, so just the two. Well, thank you so much for um, going yeah. through that with me. This was really interesting. Um, guys, if you're following along and have been watching uh, part one in this uh, part two series, I would strongly recommend, uh, you know, looking into this for yourself to assess your disease risk. Um, I think that preventative medicine is the way of the future. Um, until this point, there hasn't really been um, a preventative medical team. It's always treat the problem once it presents itself. So. Um, this is just a fantastic, um, you know, movement and guys, um, where can we find, uh, your locations if anyone watching wants to actually have, uh, their genetic profiling, uh, and, and full body MRIs, uh, completed, where can we find you? So, um, we, uh, uh my personal location is in Naples, Florida, yep. longevitybioimaging.com. There you go. Or... Uh, the uh, the other location right now is in San Diego, California at healthnucleus.com. Okay. And are there any uh, forecasting plans to expand this or are you familiar um, of something similar in other countries? Because I know we have a lot of uh, followers and viewers probably listening in from Australia and from various parts of Europe. Uh, do you know of any other centers that are doing this kind of uh, advanced uh, preventative mm -hmm. medical so this deep dive, um, to, to be honest, we, we are under an IRB doing a research. Um, so nobody out there is currently doing what we do, yeah. uh, but there are, there are several other companies that do whole genome sequencing. Okay. Um, they, they may not look at as many, uh, as many disease variants that we do and yeah. may not have the ability to report out the things we're reporting out. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of direct consumer whole genome sequencing labs out there. Yeah. Um, and I, as far as whole body MRI, I, I, I'm not sure I can point you, you guys to yeah. anywhere that really doing whole body MRI and looking at specific markers like we are. So basically guys, you've got to come to Florida and you need to go to Carl Center or you need to go to San Diego if you want this level of information collected about yourself. So um, I do have one question because I know we're going to get asked this. I know that there are kits that can be provided and sent out to people uh, to test their DNA. Um, are you familiar with any of these kits and do you know what their significance is and just how accurate they actually are comparatively? So um, it, as far as the, the direct-to-consumer test kits, most of them are looking at traits. They're looking at health traits and they're looking at specific uh, SNPs, we call them single yeah. nucleotide polymorphisms. Mm -hmm. um, the second report we looked at, when we looked at some of your fitness genes and your caffeine metabolism, mm -hmm. those are, are SNPs. Uh, there are several companies out there that are looking at these SNPs. Um, uh, Origin, 23andMe, Ancestry are some of the uh, yeah. most uh, heavily touted ones and heavily commercialized uh, yeah. and widely available ones. Um, you know, they're not looking at the whole genome. So SNPs is looking at a particular gene, looking for a specific area within mm -hmm. that gene. The whole genome sequencing is really, uh, like I said in, in the preface, looking at a, an entire set of encyclopedias yeah. uh, from front to back, line by line, letter by letter. Mm -hmm. So whole genome sequencing actually goes about 30 times deeper than um, yeah. SNP testing does. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully that answers your questions because I know you guys were wondering about that. Um, thank you so much again, Carl, for running through uh, this with me today. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually really excited to hear Lane's because he and I are super competitive and I want to know whether I have better genes than him. So, uh, again, thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you so much for your yeah. time and uh, we look forward to catching up with you again probably yeah. in 12 months. We'll do a follow-up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. All right, we'll be in touch, Holly. Have okay. a great day. Thank you.